Hi everyone, Anthony Morganti here. In today's video, I'm going to show you how I use Topaz Labs Photo AI with Lightroom. Now, I purposely didn't say as a Lightroom plugin because technically, the way I use Topaz Labs Photo AI with Lightroom isn't as a plugin. Now, there are some advantages to doing it the way I do it, but there's also some disadvantages as well. And in today's video, I'm going to talk about those advantages and those disadvantages. Now we're going to be working on this image and at first glance, this image looks overexposed. That's because it is. It isn't purposely overexposed. Um, I have my camera set up to use spot metering. And that means wherever I focus, the point I focus on, that is where my camera is going to draw exposure from. So of course on the baby gorilla, I was using single point focus, focusing on the eye of gorilla. The eye of the gorilla is kind of dark. So my camera was drawing exposure from that dark eye. And in doing so, what the camera is going to do is it's going to try to make that very dark object medium gray. So it's going to overexpose the scene entirely because it's trying to make this very dark object medium gray. Now I knew this was going to happen. If you look over at the metadata, you could see exposure bias minus one EV. I purposely set up my camera to give me one full stop of negative exposure compensation. So I was purposely underexposing this scene by one full stop. And you can see it's still overexposed, but it's still within the exposure latitude of my camera. If I go over to the develop module, and I know this has nothing to do with Topaz Labs Photo AI, but I thought some of you may find this useful. If I go over to the develop module, I turn on the clipping indicators by hitting the J key. You could see that I am clipping some of the brighter areas of the scene still, but if I take highlights down, you can see that just cleans it right up. So I'm still within the exposure latitude of my camera. Now, if I didn't use one full stop of negative exposure compensation, this might have been blown out and pulling highlights down might not have been able to rescue that in whites and exposure. It might have been just clipped permanently. So be aware of that. If you're ever photographing anything very dark, like a baby gorilla or maybe a, a black Labrador retriever, like we used to have, who's now in doggy heaven, or maybe a real, you know, Kodiak bear or something really dark. Just be aware of that. If you use spot metering, that you have to be careful with spot metering. And the same could be said if you're uh, photographing something very bright, like a, a perfectly white bird or something like that. And use spot metering. It will, in that case, underexpose the scene. So you'll have to use positive exposure compensation. I digress. Let's get back to Topaz Labs Photo AI. Now, the traditional way of using Topaz Labs Photo AI is you would right click right on it. Let's say you go over to edit in and then over and down to Topaz Photo AI. In doing it that way, you only could send it as a TIFF, PSD, or JPEG. You cannot send the raw file to Topaz Labs Photo AI when you use it as a Lightroom plugin and you try to use it this way. The advantage of my way is I keep the raw format throughout my workflow. Now, right now I have an icon raw file, .nef. What I'll do, the way I do it, is I'll get a .dng raw file, which is still a raw file, and you have all the advantages of a raw file. So that's great, because I want to keep those raw file advantages throughout my workflow. The disadvantage of doing it my way, and this could be the breaker for you why you won't do it, is... Any adjustments I do to this Nikon RAW file right now, they won't be recognized by Photo AI. Let me demonstrate. Let's go over to the profile browser and let's go to these artistic profiles and just pick like this one, Artistic 04. So it obviously looks different, right? Then we'll go to white balance and I'll use tungsten white balance. Then let's go to exposure and just bring exposure down like great. All right, it obviously looks totally different. I could go on and do more adjustments as well doesn't recognize any of these adjustments. And let me show you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to send it into Topaz Labs Photo AI the way I do it. So I keep this raw format throughout my workflow. To do it, go up to File, then down to Plugin Extras, then over and down to Process with Topaz Photo AI. When you do that, no box pops up. It's not ex asking you to choose a resolution, to choose a color space or to choose a file format, it just sends the raw file into Topaz Labs Photo AI. And you could see all those adjustments I did, didn't recognize them at all. So that's the disadvantage. But 
I'm always preaching that you should remove noise in an image as early in your workflow as possible. Well, why not do it right away? And that's what we're doing uh, when we do it this way. Now, you can see it, as far as this image is concerned, it did remove noise and it sharpened it. Of course, when you're shooting gorillas in a gorilla enclosure and you're not in, you know, the wild shooting them, uh, it, the glass is very, very thick and it's difficult to get a really sharp image. So this helps a lot. I'm going to just reposition the navigator window up here so we're looking at the baby gorilla's head. And you have to wait for it to re-render every time you do this. So you can see in the lower left-hand corner there is a progress bar. So it has to re-render. Takes a second or three. All right, it looks pretty good. And you can click on the image, get a before or after. It definitely removed all the noise. One advantage of having the image slightly overexposed is it does minimize the noise as much as possible. This was shot at ISO 6400. So there is some noise here, as you could see, especially over the darker areas, specifically the baby gorilla. But it got rid of the noise. Uh, fine. Now, it's sharper, but I'm not sure if it's sharp enough. Let's go to the sharpen area over here on image quality section. It used standard sharpening. Let's try the other two. I'm going to click on lens blur. And you have, again, you have to wait for it to re-render. You can see in the lower left-hand corner is that progress bar. So we'll let it do its thing. Let it do its thing. And you can see, uh, to me, with my nose, you know, maybe 16 inches away from the computer, that looks better um, than standard. Now, if I A-B it and go back to standard, unfortunately, you have to wait for it to re-render again. So it's hard to A-B it because you're looking now at the blurred image. There's that. We'll go back to lens blur again. And that one's a little faster now. To me, lens blur definitely looks sharper when I use that. Let's try motion blur. Now this one we have to wait to render. Let it do its thing. And once it does, and that one definitely looks sharper than standard as well. We'll try to A-B that between lens blur and motion blur. Bounce between the two. There's that one. There's that one. There's that one. There's that one. Yeah, they look pretty much identical, but they definitely both look better than standard. So I'm going to go with lens blur. And I'm going to go with the default amount of uh, noise reduction that it did, because it did a fine job there. And of course, there isn't a person here, so we don't have to worry about recovering faces. We're not increasing the resolution. This is the full resolution raw file inside of Topaz Labs Photo AI. So even if you cropped it in Lightroom, uh, Topaz Labs Photo AI, when you do it this way, it's not going to recognize the crop. You're going to get the full resolution image. So I do not need uh, or don't have to upscale it at all. So we'll go with this. So we'll go down to the lower right-hand corner and click on Save to Adobe Lightroom. It's going to take a minute or three, or a second or three, not a minute, to do this. And once it's back in Lightroom, I'll do some quick editing on it so you could see um, what it might look like when it is edited. Um, and I will show you that it will be a RAW file when we get back there. It'll be a .dng file. And if it ever finishes... And, you know, speed varies. If your computer is really fast, um, it might go faster. There's our original file. Now, it didn't bring it into my... Um, there it is here. It didn't bring it into my... Maybe another disadvantage. didn't bring it into my collection. But let's go over here. Okay. So here's the .dng file, as you could see. And here is our original file that I did all that crazy editing to. Let's just reset. So um, let's zoom in to the gorilla's face. Let me move it over here. Let's go up to view and lock the zoom position. And then let's go to this one. So there's after. All right, so there's before and there's after. There's before and there's after. Now, with this image, we could do some editing with it. Bring down exposure a little bit. Down highlights a bit. Let's open up the shaders just to touch. Get a white and black point here. And my quasi-edited image. So there's just a quick edit I did on it. So there's our fully edited image. Now if I go back to the original image and I just click 
click previous to do the editing to that one, the same editing to that one. And we again zoom in. There's before and there's after. There's before and there's after. So I think you'll agree that it looks pretty decent. I mean, for an image that at first glance might have looked like something I would have culled because it was overexposed. But like I mentioned, uh, it still was within the exposure latitude of my camera and nothing was blown out. All the detail was there inherent in the raw file. And doing it my way, I was able to keep all those raw file qualities throughout my workflow. And that's the way I go about doing it. Um, you know, give it a try. See if it works for you um, in your workflow. Thank you, everyone who watches my videos. I really do appreciate it. Talk to you guys soon.